Hello and welcome to the Access All Areas Backstage Podcast. Today we're with Freddie Fellows, head gardener and founder of Secret Garden Festival. Hi. We're in the lovely uh, surroundings of the uh, Abbott Farm, um, the uh, location of the festival. Um, can you start by define? How would you define Secret Garden Party? Um, I suppose the most fun you can have in a field without breaking the law, but. Um, <laughs> It's, I mean, it's called a party for a good reason. We always wanted to differentiate ourselves from what we saw as what festivals were when we started in 2003, which was much more like a gig in a field, really, whereas this is truly supposed to be a celebration of all the creative arts and, you know, just the fun of getting, you know, getting a large amount of like-minded people together. And it started in 2003. Two, is that right? Three. 2003. Okay. So how did it start? Was it a small sort of gathering and you kind of grew from there? Or it what was, was the... very small. It was about between five and six hundred people. And um, we, me and a friend recently sort of left university and he'd scored a job with Red Bull doing their um, first sort of promo work and um, event activation. And he, they'd got a very, very cool armoured vehicle that folded out into a sound system and our job was to go around and find landowners to do a party on their land. Kind of semi-legal, you get in touch with the nearest city, the coolest promoter there, you go, look, got this facility, bring the DJs, bring your VIP list, we'll pick them up in a coach and do it. And it was just very subtly let known that Red Bull made this happen. And um, so we're doing this and there was a point in time when this light bulb went up in my head and went, oh, Actually, my family are farmers. Should probably ask them whether there's anywhere um, on their land to do a party. And Julie asked my father and was taken down to this site and shown it. And I was like, "Are you serious? We could do a party here?" He's like, "Yeah," because I mean, he's at the end of his garden. So I was saying, "It's just there." And I remember turning, you know, going back to my friend and saying, "There is no way we're giving this to Red Bull. We need to do our own party here. This is too good an opportunity." And so we duly did. Um, and like all good friends from university that start a business, we managed to fall out about four months after that. And we'd done it to launch a production company. And um, the sort of the divorce chat went along the lines of, "I can't work with you anymore. You keep the event. I'll keep the company." And I'd never really thought of actually, in honesty, doing the event every year. But um, so I suppose it was born out of sort of bloody mindedness and a desire to spite. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, it, you know, in seriousness, we, you know, we'd the idea behind it come from we'd grown up with the free party and rave scene and had loved that freedom of expression and, um, you know, how it brought people together. But I always found that it was very, I suppose, monotheistic in a music sense. Um, and live music was exploding again, at the, you know, in the early noughties. And so we were looking at the idea of putting something together that actually had this huge range of all the things that were wonderful going on musically um, and put it in a field. And that sort of also then gradually evolved into working out or thinking about what made a good party. and. I've sort of, I mean, I've repeated this line often enough, but I always think it's it's about the people you meet rather than the main stage act and the fireworks. If you think back to the best parties or evenings of your life, that's really what makes them stands out is the person, you know, the new friend you've met that you've, you know, never seen before. And so a lot of the, I suppose, the whimsy or the wackiness and um, all the interactive stuff was conceived as a way of breaking down barriers and getting people to chat with each other. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's lots of um, things, uh, evidence of, of barriers and, uh, being broken right down to the bare minimum in terms of lots of nudity, need swimming, <laughs> um, you know, mud wrestling, all sorts of uh, things have sort of happened in this site over the, over the years. So has that always been sort of encouraged, that kind of sort of crazy hedonistic kind of um, behavior um, um yeah i mean i think it's i mean it's interesting there's a, there's a friend of mine who also does an event who um sort of jokingly describes us as enforced wackiness which i can sort of see but it actually it actually was born out of um a lack of prohibition really we always sort of believed that it was much easier to let people do anything they wanted and make make that safe and possible rather than telling people they can't go swimming or they can't take their clothes off or whatever and once we 
sort of start people started engaging with that then also people started coming up to us with all sorts of ideas they wanted to do that you know we were mad enough to enable and um, you know help them help them achieve but the festival industry's you know grown hugely over the years since you launched um, I mean back then you know obviously Glastonbury was was the still and has been for many years obviously that was the kind of key landmark event wasn't it and then um you know there were events like the big chill but it's there's so many more sort of smaller boutique festivals i suppose now but um back then i mean what were the kind of key inspirations for you or the, or the most influential events i guess that you kind of went to did you take did you start afresh and just want to do something completely individual or were the were you, were you sort of uh, i mean a bit of both i think when we started 2003 it was we were very much trying to come up with something that wasn't out there on the landscape because and we were, were creating the type of event we really wanted to go to and no one else was providing. I mean Glastonbury is the sort of mothership of of festivals and there's almost everything that you could ever dream of doing they've done before. It's a bit like The Simpsons, you know, they've done it before. But um, I think, uh, you know, one event that really has inspired us and um, this is in 2006 where we'd got we'd suddenly started gaining popularity and we'd moved our main stage from there down to there and we suddenly realized we were running a festival or getting very close to running a festival i mean people were turning up with picnic chairs and stuff like that and um that was the year we actually first went to burning man on the recommendation of um a dj the year before adam freeland who'd said you've got to go to this place and check it out and had our week out in the desert and afterwards we were sitting in a bar in San Francisco and it's just like I mean if anything can give you the confidence that actually we were on the right track with all the lunacy and the crazy stuff that's got to be it let's go balls to the floor on you know on that because you know this is this is clearly our thing and our you know what we want to do rather than worrying about a VIP area or you know whether you've got enough lanyards for people's programs or space for their picnic chairs or what have you <laughs> Um, you also you had a, I'm talking about VIPs there. I mean, you had a, a visit from um, a, a, one of the royal family, didn't you? One one year and uh, <laughs> didn't have a VIP area to put them in because that's not the kind of event this is. But how did you cope with that? Um, it was interesting because my I really admit my first response was actually we really don't want this to happen, and we didn't want the attention and just felt rather uncomfortable about it. And I, was my, I think it was my sister who said, "Look, it's really unfair." This poor guy doesn't get a chance to go to anything, you know, without being, you know, all this baggage. You're, you know, you've always talked about inclusivity. Come on. And it's just like, yeah, OK, you're right. And we thought about it for a bit and um, we came up with the wheeze of booking four or five Prince Harry lookalikes to wander around the party as well. So that he had a reasonable sort of plausible deniability about whether he was the real Prince Harry or not. <laughs> I mean, we didn't tell his um, security detail this until the day of it. Um, but they were, yeah, I think, I mean, I think it worked. I think he had a good time. But um, it was, I mean, it was a lovely thing to do, but it was a mixed blessing because obviously it was all over the tabloids. And, you know, yeah. you are then the, you know, the party blessed by royal attendance or decree for good or bad. Did that change in any way? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of exposure on the back of that. Did that mean the following year you had sort of demographic coming to the event that maybe wouldn't have come in previous years? I, th I certainly raised our profile a lot, and it was something we had seen up until that point. I think we were very had very much been building through word of mouth, sort of that one fan at a time thing, and therefore everyone the coming really knew what they were buying into and what who we were. And I think that probably was the beginning of us you know having a percentage of audience who were buying into it because it was this festival they'd known about and it's cool they didn't really know why or what they were they were going to but it was I think when our reputation or our our fame was sort of slightly started getting out of our control a bit um which was what eventually led us in 2017 to calling a halt to it um intentionally then for forever but um you know, anything can happen. As it turns out in the intervening four years, almost everything did happen with lockdown and Brexit and, you know, war in Europe and what have you. Um, at which point we thought this is, this seems silly and a bit spoiled to have ended this festival for those reasons. And, um, you know, we shouldn't take the, the chance to, you know, host an amazing 
um, gathering in a place like this for granted. And um, so for better or for worse, um, we, we came back. As I sort of like to say, all good things must come to an end. And so we're back. <laughs> <laughs> but I think really, I mean, the experience of, of um, solitude that everyone had to endure during the COVID years, you know, on the back of that, I think, you know, coming, I think my first festival after that was uh, Latitude, I think. And it was just the atmosphere was just electric throughout the site. People yeah. were just so happy to be with people again. So, I mean, I guess, was, did that have anything to do with the idea that, you know, to bring this back, you know, the fact that, you know, you maybe made you appreciate even more how special an event or how special an event of this kind of nature is? I mean, a hundred percent. It was, it was a combination of that and some very kind people decided to make a feature length documentary about us, which they filmed a lot of the footage in our last year in 2017 and took them a long time to get the edit right, get the narrative right on it, and then find a distributor and backer. And in the third lockdown, all this came together. They got the, you know, the final edit that they were really happy with. They got that backer and they were approaching us about how they did the sort of premiere. So what we'd love to do is a bit like, you know, a sort of reality secret cinema, I suppose, type thing of do the first screening on the site with a couple of the venues that the garden party are known for. And so I sat down, tried to do the budget on this. And third lockdown, I don't know about you, that was the worst lockdown. <laughs> I mean, despair. Yeah, our blitz spirit had disappeared <laughs> by that time. It yeah. was, you know, it was dark and, you know, cold and what have you. And it was literally a bit of a, you know, screw it moment of like, let's just do it again. It would be just easier. And, um, so, I mean, I suppose in similar as how we started it, we, we bundled back into it blind, optimistically and, um, you know, with, um, the best will in the world, but, um, I think rather shocked then at how much the landscape had changed just in terms of costs. And we were talking earlier about a very much change in the, the expertise and workforce in the, in the industry and a lot of new challenges now out there. Um, but, um wouldn't change it for the world talking about kind of changing i mean has, has there been any kind of obviously the event as a as, as you've evolved it over the years it's you know it's it's a colorful creative dynamic event you know that hasn't just rolled out the same kind of um infrastructure and creatives every every year i mean are you how did i guess the question really is how do you, how you sort of how you've evolved it now in its kind of you know comeback years if you like well i mean i think our the first sort of step we made this year is going into a social enterprise uh, so really um sticking our flag in the ground around being a force for good and this um uh, incubation of um, talent and creativity and you know leveraging all the things we can do as a you know as a 100 percent independent event in this area and so i think that's that's where for me the the vitality and the novelty now coming in is is actually um, formalizing the way we're finding and supporting new talent, whether it's musicians or visual artists or people who want to organize mud wrestling or have you. Um, because, you know, obviously all the, you know, the people that grew up with us and created this amazing content are all now very grown up. They've got children and jobs and, you know, they, they don't want to do their, their thing for absolutely nothing or for a wing and a prayer and a sandwich anymore. And. So it's about, you know, keeping that cultivation and letting people know that there is this facility for you coming along and realizing whatever it is you want to, you want to sort of make happen in the field. And when it's up, when, um, can you just talk me through, you know, how obviously it's a year round project for you, but not for everyone, obviously. So the team, you know, builds and builds and builds the closer you get to, to the event itself. But can you just talk, talk me through who the kind of core, core you know, nucleus of this event are, if you like, and how, um, it, it, you know, in terms of what it gets to, but when it get when the event's up and running in terms of the number of people are actually uh, putting it together. Yeah, well, I suppose, I mean, you know, you start in sort of November or whatever, it's um, uh, me and my darling wife, Amy, um, uh, sort of strategizing, working out who we want to get involved, what the, the sort of the style of this, this year is going to be. And I've got a permanent general manager because we do other events here and help other people um produce parties on this land so there's it's a it's a year-round business in that area so we go from a team of three to then 
we've got some very long-standing and amazing um, musical producer and technical director, so James Brennan, um, who's been with us. Uh, I think um, eighteen seventy was now, um, and we grow and grow from that point to. Um, in, if you don't include all our stewards and um, security and what have you, we're certainly up to 200, 300 people just before show day of, um, of crew. So it's, um, yeah, it goes from a very small family to a very large family over the year. And we're obviously at the point where we're just about to have that population explosion on site. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I know that you've got people like Chris McMeeker from Contra and Jeff's involved mm. in it. I mean, other key creative people that will look after different sections of it because obviously you've got these lovely areas in the woods and the different stages and you know it's a really diverse area just walking around now and it's kind of just starting to come together but when it's you know when it when it's up and running um it's a super colorful <laughs> kind of creative um you know, vista of, di of different things and, and structures and, and activities so do you have kind of people that are help you with specific areas or is it no, absolutely. So, I mean, Chris, or Chris Tofu, as we we all know him as, he's, you know, he, he's actually been a long-term sort of um, supporter, contributor, programmer of, of the Garden Party, because, I mean, he brings something very unique in that field in terms of who he, you know, programs and corrals. And we, tr you know, we work a lot in that area of looking for people with that energy, that unique vision to pull together that scene, that style, that area, because you know, everyone has their individual talents and you can't be good at everything. I mean, I I thoroughly enjoy the, the new talent side and a lot of the visual art and direction and creativity. Um, I, you know, I can spot a good band a mile off. I can't, you know, I'm less good on the electronic programming, but we've got some great friends and members of the family who are very good in that area and, you know, and so on and so on. So. It is, yeah, for all the looking out for the new talents, new contributions, there's there's a lot to be said for um, uh, the experienced veterans in that area of who are, who've got sight of all the, you know, new young hip gunslingers that are out there that we should be, you know, getting involved with. Is it a good time for the festival industry right now? I know, I know there's challenging times as costs, inflation and everything else. We, we talked about um, during COVID, obviously a lot of people, um, by necessity kind of went to work in film and, and uh, mm. other, other sectors other industries um but in terms of the kind of talent coming through um you know are you are you fairly encouraged by what you're seeing in the industry i mean i i think we're we were talking about this actually last night me and my wife and um we think it's a really exciting time in terms of musical talent and other creative talents out there there is an absolute wealth and and I think, you know, a huge amount to do with how social media has evolved and worked. It's, there's a lot more visibility and ability to, to find and communicate with, with these new emerging artists, which is, you know, really exciting. And I, you know, there is a, as I say, a, a you know, a huge groundswell of talented people who are, and who are not, who are coming to you, not through the sort of traditional roots of the industry. Um, but on the flip side, I think every, you know, every festival promoter this year and to a degree last year will say that it's a very different landscape now. The market's behaving in a very different way. Um, I think what was right and what was popular 10 years ago is, you know, not necessarily right and popular yeah. now. And, um, and that's where being able to change and adapt is very, very important. And we're very grateful to be as independent and as self-sufficient of, you know, having our own site mm -hmm. as we are, so we can be fleet-footed and nimble in this new world. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about independence, I mean, obviously it's um, it's very important to have, you know, the, the independent sector in the festival market. Um, obviously everyone's got their different, you know, role and it's, Live Nation do great work and Superstruct do great work, but are you at all concerned by the way that the market's been kind of increasingly controlled, if you like, by the big players. I'd be lying if I said it hasn't affected us. And we've, um, uh, I think one of the, the hardest things for, for us to have swallowed in recent years and, you know, and pre-19, uh, pre-2017 um, is things like exclusivity clauses 
and we got we found it very frustrating last year where we'd sold out back in September we weren't actually announcing our lineup and we were still being subject to exclusivity clauses on artists that were you know not headliners they weren't even main support or second support size and that that does feel that's you know that's kind of hard to to swallow as a smaller independent festival when that's done to you by the, the slightly bigger boys on the football pitch as it were um but you know there's a place for everyone and um you know i mean one of the best one of the best days of live music i've ever attended was um a reading festival um been 15 years ago because i haven't been back since but it was you know you want to go for the best ever lineup of that the music you love yeah you know those guys smashing out of the park yeah um but um yeah i think there's there is a real importance to keep independence in the in the industry because there is a lot of things we can do and things we can spearhead that is not necessarily as easy for the larger internationals and i mean for instance i think we've managed to pioneer some things in health and safety whether it's the practice of paint fight for instance um there was that awful um accident in um the middle east or the far east of i think i can't remember whether it's indonesia where they let off some paint powdered paint cannons at the same time as some indoor pyro and they weren't using the right powdered paint and it ignited oh. and in in a small club of sort of 800 people yeah and the for quite recently the first response of sort of the health and safety executive in england was like how to pay fights indoor outdoor no we're not for this and we actually were able to talk to them and say look we've been doing this for quite a long time this is what we use it's essentially powdered up kids paint non-toxic um water-based paint um you know it isn't flammable and we are willing to invite you down and demonstrate how we do it and we'll, we'll stick our necks out and take that risk in order that you can actually see that this is okay and you know other people are allowed to do it you know, that's you know that's a great thing to do and you know at the other end of the spectrum i mean you know being able to pioneer and be the first festival to do public access drugs testing was you know a a great benefit and ability or leveraging of our independence again being able to go out and take a risk that you know potentially if you're answering to shareholders and a board would be something that might be quite hard and you know, much harder to sort of to pass with the team yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that was one of the things I was going to ask you about. I mean, how what was the reaction to to that? What has been the reaction over the years to that from local authorities, police, and actually attendees? Um, well, I mean, starting with local authorities and the police, it's the first time we started breaching the case. Um, our silver commander was just like, "No, nah, we're not having this conversation." I, you know, I kind of get where you're coming from, but. No. And so I sort of stepped back for a couple of years and then sat back down and said, look, we're going to have this conversation again. And, you know, there was more research and more um, uh, sort of case studies of what the Loop had been doing in, I think, both Brighton and Manchester at that stage. And, you know, much to my amazement and huge respect for the Silver Commander we, were, we had then, she listened to all this and went, yeah, actually, we're going to go for this. And, you know, we actually think this is a good idea. Um, I think they'd got round to realizing that, and I, this is in her own words, is that actually once your audience has cut through the gates and through that security search and that point of control, your chance to enforce the law of drugs are illegal has gone. You are now in a position of just care and duty of care and protecting the vulnerable. So you know harm reduction is a phrase that you know was something i don't think the police really used that much you know until about eight ten eight ten years ago and is now something that i you know i think is a very common concept and it had an amazing response initially in the first probably day and a half there was a mild amount of suspicion i think from the public <laughs> of you know is this a trap or not yeah. and we made you know we were very careful to cite the loop's tent far away from the security and the medical so you don't want suddenly someone appearing in a flash jacket when you're you're trying to sort of build this trust with your audience but very quickly 
um, people realised what an amazing facility it was and whether them and their friends had had something tested or they were looking at the notice board for the results that had been published. But um, our, you know, our admissions to welfare, medical and our admissions to hospital dropped by about two thirds that year. Wow. And then, the, wow. you know, and kept at the same level the next year. Sadly, we're not in the same situation at the moment. Um, that ability to do what's called front of house drugs testing isn't being allowed at the moment by the Home Office for, and I think actually this is put very well by Melvin Benn in The Guardian a couple of days ago, um, that um, they are, you know, that they've, they've pulled this back and for very hard to understand reasons because the loop are applying for a permanent license to be able to do this in a couple of city centres around England and while the Home Office is considering this they're not willing to consider any temporary licenses for this elsewhere so you know if I was going to be you know a little bit rude about the Home Office it seems they could consider that there is such a thing as too much harm reduction. <laughs> um, in terms of the government then um, I understand there's uh, an all, parli all party parliamentary group being put together to represent festivals and discuss issues with you know government representatives um, obviously there was um, funding from the government during the pandemic and actually you know the industry kind of came together with more of a collective voice than it ever had done previously to represent you know the, the not just the cultural value but the, obviously the economic value which mm. is what, what counts when it comes to to um, to government really um, so that was that's all really positive. But do you, is the, what would you be your kind of call for from government? What you know, if, are you sort of content with the way that they're treating and and reacting to the festival industry? I mean, outside what we've just talked about about the you know the policy around drugs and harm reduction, which is it's moving slowly in the right direction, but it, we are not in an ideal spot at the moment. I mean, I think there is more the government could do and look at examples of how other governments approach this when it comes to um, the live industry and live music. And I mean, France is a great example of their music export bureau is the amount they support their own um, domestic artists to go and play in other countries is phenomenal in its um, approach and its um, sort of generosity, I think, and its faith in its artists, which, you know, doesn't really exist here. I think, you know, and I think there are there are areas that we've always found rather hard to stomach in terms of the, the PRS um, approach to how events are, are charged, you know, which is, this is an old beef, but when you're being charged a percentage of your ticket sales, which covers all our infrastructure, you know, and that's they do the same for an indoor club, but a, you know, an indoor venue doesn't have to build the venue every time they do the show. Yeah. So being charged a percentage of what you're spending on lose, which then goes to the, you know, into the PRS and is paid out to whoever's played on Radio 1, 2 and what have you the most, that doesn't seem to be supporting new emerging talent and artists in the way that it should. So, you know, we're, we're by no means in a bad situation, but there's a, I think there's a lot we can learn from other countries and a lot more we, you know, the government could do in that area. Uh, uh. Um, how important do you think it, festivals are in terms of young people's mental health? I think, I mean, vital and pivotal. And I mean, this is, this is not a new thing. This is, you know, the practice of like-minded people coming together to share ideas and different approaches is ancient. Um, and we were talking about, you know, as saying earlier about how a lot of the inspiration for us came from the rave culture. And that was you know, definitely a zeitgeist in society of people getting together and realizing the similarities were far more than any differences out there. And, you know, it's had a sort of unfathomable change on society and I think on mental health. And I think going further, you know, with that now, as um, 
you know, events are more sophisticated in how they approach and more varied in what they do, you know, you have the opportunity to, you know, with mental health as a direct example of being able to talk to people actually about that and removing stigma around subjects like that and, you know, all sorts of other ones, whether it comes to sexual safety or, um, you know, welfare care and drugs. It's a, you know, it's vital. But I think, you know, at its core, it is a, a you know, it's a visceral part of life to, you know, get together and realize is the, the similarities and celebrate the differences between yourself and your, your peers. And for you, it must have been an interesting, I mean, a, a fascinating journey the last you know, 20 years or so in terms of the kind of people and the behavior and the characters you've had, you know, on, 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 your, on your land here. I mean, it's an impossible question I appreciate to, to answer, but, you know, I, I'm not looking for one highlight, but if you, if, you, if you like, I mean, there must be some experiences that you've had that are always the ones that bubble to the top when, you, when you're thinking about, you know, momentous occasions. It, I mean... You're right. This, I mean, this is always it's one of the sort of hardest questions to answer. And I, off the cuff, there were sort of three I've thought of recently. What well, one that was triggered just earlier by you talking about um, are the proliferation of sort of um, naked bodies at our festival, whatever. And we used to have a phrase that very much came from the rave scene. It was like it's not a it's not a real party until there's a naked guy or uh, you know on the dance floor, and. Um, the first year we did it, a great friend of mine was stage managing the main stage. And we got to the end on Sunday and she's like, so how did it go? And I was like, it's pretty good. But, you know, I'm not sure it was a real party because we didn't, you know, we didn't have a naked person running around. <laughs> and she's like, well, uh, this fizz off. And the head of licensing comes up and is like, how did it go? And all the rest. And as he says this, this woman, stark bollard naked, runs three times around us and back to the backstage. <laughs> and he goes, um... So do you, do you know who that was? And I had to admit that was my stage manager. So um, that was definitely a standout. Um, and I think there's other, you know, more, much more personal experiences that are, that's, I mean, incredibly humbling and rewarding and makes you realize how privileged you are to be in a position to do something like this, where um, we had, I think about year five or six, um, a, an email sent personally to me from a woman who had been in a car accident about 12 months before um, the garden party, had a life-changing um, injuries that had put her in a wheelchair. And her emails, Tracy essentially said, I didn't really think fun and festivals or any of this was going to be for me anymore. That door had closed and I got taken to your festival and I've realized that life can be all of that and more, despite the fact I'm in a wheelchair. And I mean, I get you know, goosebumps still recounting that sort of 17 years later. I mean, that really, you know, makes, puts a lot of this into perspective. But I mean, from, I mean, going from that to some of the other more, you know, um, uh, ridiculous events, um, I was, um, of course, remembering recounts story of when we had Grace Jones um, at play here, who had a very ambitious um, idea around how the her gig was going to start. It's going to be this amazing AV show. And then she was going to rise out of the stage with haze all around her. <laughs> yeah. And we had this all set up and we we're good to go. And the scissor lift broke. And um, so the solution that they were happy with was that we um, lifted Grace Jones on the back of a roadie through this hole in the stage <laughs> and sort of <laughs> slowly shoved her up. Um, and consummate professional that she was, she, you know, she absolutely styled it out and took that one. <laughs> um, in terms of, I mean, this is obviously, you know, your, your family have a history of farming and obviously this is, you know, primarily a, a farm uh, land. So... You mentioned your your father's just you know his back gate is is just over there. <laughs> so, I mean, how sort of welcoming has he been? And uh, was he when I guess when he first launched the event? And and have there ever been any sort of has he ever kind of turned his nose up at it and gone and, and been resistant to it, or is he very much kind of indulged in the whole sort of? Um, well, I mean, I've you know I've said several times that you know the garden party is all my fault, but actually it's all his fault because um, as I said, when he first came and showed us me this bit of land and said you could have a party here, I was like, really? Like, wow! So um, that gives you an idea about um, how supportive he is. But there was, um, you know, bearing in mind this, they've got an amazing garden down there, and it's separated from all these party goers by a steel shield fence and. It wasn't until I think 
2006 or 7 and we had an artist called Soko come and play. It's one of the first English gigs she'd ever done and I'd been a huge fan of this artist for a long time and I don't normally go and meet artists after the gig. I'm a bit shy about that but uh, this was too good and I was just like thank you so much for coming that was so amazing and with a very sort of heavy and slightly seductive French accent she's like oh it's no problem now will you show me the real secret garden <laughs> and sort of slightly like take me back I didn't know whether this was a proposition or what and gradually the penny dropped that what was the other side of that steel shield fence of my dad's garden was known colloquially as the real secret garden and the the challenge or the fun for some punters each year was to try and scale the fence and go for an explore in this beautiful garden. <laughs> so, I mean, there's definitely, I think that if anything's been a challenge for my dad, it would have been that. And there was, <laughs> there was one year where me and my girlfriend, it was a hot Friday or Saturday afternoon, and we had a couple of hours break. I said, you know what, let's just go and hide out in dad's garden and just lie down under a tree for, you know, half an hour or an hour, just, you know, have a bit of a time out which we duly did and um after about an hour sort of got up off the rug and saw that my dad and family were all out on their terrace having food so we cheerily waved at them and then went back to work <laughs> later on in the afternoon my dad and my stepmother come up to me and going we've had some trespasses in the garden she said would you believe the gall of them they actually waved at us <laughs> having relocated due to the camera shutting down because of the extreme temperatures we're enduring here <laughs> on site um no so um we were talking about the the real secret garden uh being <laughs> essentially your dad's back garden <laughs> um but um you know over the years you've done lots of extraordinary and, and fun things like you know created um spaces that you, know, you stumble across and obviously create great word of mouth around the, the site and uh one of these kind of secret spaces was um was actually a sunflower field, a field that you could access by going into a, a toilet block with the back of which had been taken out and people would, were sort of transported from a toilet into this wonderful sunflower field with a band playing in the, in the middle of that which is uh, which is beautiful I mean so um, where do you get these ideas from and how much of an integral part I suppose are they in, in, in the event having these sort of you know these things that people can discover? Well I mean I think they're very integral and I think one of the things we love doing is um, a feature like that that maybe only one, 10, 20 people in the whole festival find, but it blows their minds. And that's, I think that's a really special part of what we do. Um, and I mean, that, that particular one came through some people who wanted to do a, a feature of some sunflowers in our event site. And we were, we were nervous about whether or not we could get them to flower in time. So um, we thought if we put it behind a production line, if they didn't flower, there would be no foul and we could pretend we never tried it. And um, if it did, then we could do it. So then th that's how then organically we got to the idea of the, the secret entrance. And it became a rather wonderful art piece. Um, but I think, you know, when you're, when you're talking about some of these secret areas and discoverable things, it's very important that they evolve and they change and they're not repeated um, because expectation is the, the mother of all disappointment. And in fact, one of the if I'm allowed to say funniest letters of complaint I've ever received was from a lady whose uh, main beef was that she was promised secret spaces but couldn't find any of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of ha having been treated to a, a kind of tour of the site, um, you know, and the woodland and everything else, and the way you, you use organic material and the way that you upcycle um, old props and, and, and things like that, it's, it's obviously, you know, sort of you're naturally minimizing your impact on, 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 the, on the environment, as it were. So could you just talk me through kind of um, some of the key sustainability considerations that you take when you, when you put on this, this event? Well, I mean, we t I mean, almost every consideration possible we take, because at the end of the day, this is where we live. Um, and, you know, you don't foul your own, your own house, really. Yeah. Um, so um, we've doing everything we've gone to a fully compostable loo system now which we process the compost on site and eventually actually gets spread on the fields and um, dare I say it then grows potatoes which we um, then serve back at the festival that's a not too unpleasant for the cycle of life to imagine um, and you know we're looking at all sorts of um, in the future um, sustainable ways to generate power because I think that's a challenge going forward um, you know, both on input costs and impact, because I think, 
you know, it's important to remember the two go hand in hand. It's very hard and to encourage any festival, whether they own the land or not, to be um, more ecologically sound if it's very much um, cost prohibitive and there's no, you know, actual tradable value in it for them. But I, you know, thankfully that is more and more of a consideration with people coming to events, which is great. Um, you know, things like reusable cup schemes are very important. Um, and, you know, we plow a lot of the, the money in the, the, that we make from the event back into planting trees and managing the wildlife around here, because that is, you know, that's an important element. 40 years ago, we were, you know, intensively farming for, you know, as a result of post-war landscape and food security. And, um, you know, it's, it's great to be working in this at a time where that isn't um, the, the, the sort of main drive for us and actually looking after the wildlife and not over sort of stretching the land in any of its uses being, you know, more important than, you know, beating your, your acreage for the highest yield, whether that's from a festival or from, from growing weed. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you've been sort of in this game, I guess, for well, 20 years now with this event. Um, You've obviously learned a lot and experienced a lot along the way. Uh, if what, what kind of advice would you give to a young person considering um, getting into this business in terms of maybe launching their first event or starting with a small party with the hope of building it into something like you've managed to achieve here? Um, I suppose I mean it's two key points: is don't imagine to make money very quickly or possibly even at all. If you want to make um, your millions, this is not. This is not the industry for you. But I'd, I think if, certainly if I had to give myself age 24 um, advice from, from 20 years worth of experience, is get a good bookkeeper and accountant. Um, because that, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that is integral. Great stuff. And where do you see, I mean, do you see yourself still doing this in 20 years time? Do you think this is gonna be around for the same, have the same sort of longevity of, of an event like Glastonbury? Um, goodness, if you asked me in year three of the garden party, did I see me still doing it in five years time, I'd have laughed in your face and said, I doubt <laughs> it very much. So, I mean, I have no idea. I think, um, I hope so, because I think where we're going with the social enterprise and looking to start um, incubating and supporting talent and emerging artists and people who want to get into this area from backgrounds that they don't have access to um, to, get, to get into this and practice it is is really exciting for me and I think gives certainly for me more um, a new fresh excitement in doing it that um, you know you could otherwise lose because it you know it, it can be hard it could be very easy to get jaded doing this and um, I think you know it's um, it's very important to still see the joy and the, the, the sort of um, emotional and you know, ethical rewards in doing this. So, yeah, I mean, I think it would be lovely if, um, if that side of it was still going in 20 years, because I really envisage it, you know, it taking the, the, the force for good further in this event. Great stuff. And I know um, you'll be wanting to keep something secret about the, <laughs> your, the, this year's event, but um, what are you sort of most looking forward to? Um, I guess this year oh there's i mean it's a mix between some of the artists we've got playing this year where i mean i think even this year even more than others um it's going to be a rush from one stage to another i think i'm djing the least i've ever dj'd at my own event just simply because there's too many artists i want to see um so that's you know that's definitely um a huge part of excitement i think um but then I think also from the creative side, we're really excited with some of the set designs and set builds that we've um, we've come up with this year. And um, I think our Saturday night spectacle is probably, I'm the most excited and most nervous about in equal measure. because we're, <laughs> we're attempting to do a couple of things that um, we've never done before. And I think um, if we were possibly in our right minds, we probably wouldn't be attempting to do either. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for taking time oh, out cool. and, thank you, uh, and taking, showing us around. You're more than welcome. <laughs>